Hi everybody, I'm Katie Anderson. I'm an outdoor education program specialist at Cremaca Outdoor School, and I'm also a volunteer uh, member of the Board of Directors for the Association for Environmental and Outdoor Education, AEOE. Um, and I'd like to welcome you to this presentation. Today we're gonna be talking about the use of technology and how it can enhance an outdoor education experience. Uh, let us begin. For balancing technology and nature, ideas for using appropriate technology in the outdoor classroom, brought to you by me, Katie Anderson, outdoor education specialist for the San Diego County Office of Education's Cuyamaca Outdoor School. So you might be thinking, how can technology be used in outdoor education? Well, you can use it to identify animals and plants through some apps. Um, you can also use those apps in addition to or in place of field guides. That's how I use them. I use them in addition to. So they have students have their regular field guides plus an app that they can look things up with. Um, primarily, I use the app called Merlin. It's a bird ID app. Um, there's also an app called Seek, which does animals and plants and fungus just by using the camera on your device. And we'll talk a little bit more about those two apps in just a second. Um, you can also use technology to connect to the global scientific community through citizen science. You can collect and share data um, to citizen science projects or community science projects. Um, those projects include eBird and iNaturalist. You might be familiar with those two. Um, you could also invite a scientist into your classroom using technology, either through Zoom meetings or Google Hangouts or something like that. You can also use technology to provide information quickly. I know a lot of us are used to um, using Google Docs to send information to our participants and have them send it back, um, but you can also use it uh, for your orientation or menus or daily schedules or to share group expectations with a large group if, if you're using a screen with a digital projector or even a monitor on your wall. There's no wait time, there's no turnaround time. You can create a presentation um, and edit it day to day on your own computer and then um, project that or put that on your monitor. Unlike the printed materials that we used to use in the past or maybe some of us still do. And there's an example of a calendar on a monitor. So when you're trying to decide if you should invite technology into your program, it's definitely something that you wanna do. Um, you don't just wanna jump out and buy the latest, greatest thing, but really take some time to think about um, how the technology can be used. And you want to think about, does it enhance your program? Is it gonna be a benefit? Does it make your program more accessible? So will you have students who can understand the material better uh, through technology? Does it make it able to broadcast out and market your program to the greater world? Like how accessible will your program be to your folks who are participating with the use of this technology? Um, you want to make sure, uh, think about, does it increase the efficiency of your program? If adding technology is more of a hindrance, um, then you probably don't want it. Um, you want to make sure that the, the addition of the technology is a, a benefit and, and increases your efficiency. Um, maybe your staff can do things faster or better. Um, maybe your students can turn in their work more quickly but efficiency is one of the reasons why we want to include technology. And if it's not efficient, it's not worth it. Speaking of worth it, is it cost effective? Um, is, is the price of investment in the technology going to pay for itself over time? I will give you a very quick example of how um, we found out that technology would be more cost effective than paper um, at my program. We do an orientation on Monday and we have visual aids. And until about last year, they were on um, giant poster sized paper. Um, and they had, we'd been using the same ones for about 10-ish years and they were getting a little bit outdated. 
um, we had updated some of our orientation process and the flip charts just didn't match with the information we were giving students. So we decided, hey, let's reprint these posters. Well, we have, turns out that purchasing um, TV monitors was going, six of them, was going to be cheaper than having the posters printed, laminated, um, drilled, so they can be a flip chart. So is it cost effective? Yes, go for it. Um, the other thing you wanna consider is will it be a distraction? Will the technology be so overwhelming to your staff or your students or your participants that it is just distracting them from what they're really there to do, which is enjoy, learn about, and have an experience in nature. As you can see, the students in this photo, they're using a GPS to do a geocaching activity, um, and they're obviously not distracted by the GPS, but they're definitely still getting that immersion in nature. Um, so that was a good move. So let's talk about some of the apps that you can use to uh, make that connection with nature. One I like to use is the Merlin Bird app. It helps you identify birds. There are some pros. Um, it is developed by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, so the data is pretty solid. You can also um, take a photo of a bird and upload it, and it'll tell you by looking at the photo. There's, it uses data from the Citizen Science Project called eBird and Cornell to make the IDs. And there's 62,000 plus birds worldwide available on this app. You can customize it for your location and it helps narrow things down. It's available for um, Apple products through iOS and the App Store and also on the Android platform through Google Play. And it is free, yay. There are some cons. If you choose to use this, you have to be connected to a Wi-Fi network, either through um, cell phone data or through like your site's Wi-Fi. If you don't have access to Wi-Fi, this will not work correctly. So that's kind of a problem. It's really good for um, bird watching in urban areas because you are connected. Here we can see Merlin in action. If you if you've ever wondered, what is that bird? Let Merlin help you unlock the mystery. Merlin is a new app from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. It makes bird identification easier by showing you the birds in your own area that match what you've seen. Merlin asks you a few simple questions. When and where did you see the bird? What did it look like? And what was it doing? Almost like magic, Merlin shows you the most likely species for your area on that day. But these aren't wild guesses. Merlin knows which birds are near you by tapping into eBird, a database with millions of sightings from birders around the world. It finds out which species you're most likely to encounter and tailors results for your location. Browse Merlin's shortlist of photos to find your match. Once you know the name of the bird you've seen, a whole new world opens up. Listen to sounds. Learn more about where the species lives. Tell your friends about your new bird. Then go find another bird to identify. Whether it's your first time watching birds or whether you've always wanted to learn more, Merlin is ready to help. Um, another app that you can use for animal and plant ID is called Seek. Um, I've used this one with an after school program. Um, it's pretty simple as far as users are, are concerned. It's pretty easy to use. It is developed by iNaturalist, which is another citizen science project, um, and they partner with National Geographic Society and the California Academy of Sciences. Um, this app also IDs fungus, not just plants and animals. You don't need to register for an account for eBird. You actually do need an account, but for this one, you don't need to register. 
Um, you don't need to put in your name. Your location is actually obscured and they don't save the data. So um, it's a little more private. Um, that's why I was using it with students at an after school program. It is available on iOS, Android, and I mean, sorry, and Android, and it also is free. There are some cons. Um, it must be connected to a cell network or Wi Fi in order to work. And it doesn't contribute data to citizen science projects. So, if that was something you were interested in, this probably wouldn't be your best bet. Um, but if you're like, hey, I just want to know what that butterfly is or that flower is, this is a great app. Um, some other information the image recognition on this app is based on the data from iNaturalist and other partners. And it's super cool because you can earn progress badges. So that's one of the reasons why I like to use it. And if you've never seen Seek in action before, I have another video about <laughs> teacher and you're doing a project around your schoolyard or again like I used to do an after school program where the staff and students had access to Wi-Fi and also cell phones. Um, you can also use it on a tablet. So let's talk about some citizen science projects that we can use to connect to the global science community. One is eBird. A lot of people are familiar with this one. It's the world's largest biodiversity related citizen science project with more than 100 million bird sightings contributed each year by eBirders around the world. You may have used that in your program already. Um, it is available three ways on the web and through apps in iOS and Android. The mobile app for eBird can be used offline. You can enter all your data offline. So if you're out in the field away from any sort of network opportunity, um, it'll save your data. And then once you get back in to where you get a signal, you can just hit the button and it sends your data. But it you can you can collect data in real time even if you're offline. It's one of the reasons why I enjoy using this. It's managed by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, and their website is www.ebird.org. If you're interested in setting up this project for your site or your program, um, visit ebird.org and you can learn a little bit more about that. Another citizen science project is iNaturalist. Um, this one is a biodiversity um, project for plants and animals it's online it's like a social network um, for people to share their sightings it's also a crowdsourced identification system so if you don't know what something is you can take a picture of it um, it goes on the site and then other people have the opportunity to id it for you so instead of going hey cheryl what kind of bird is that you can just i naturalist it and cheryl can get to it when she can. Um, it is web-based and it also has apps for iOS and Android. It has a teacher's guide available um, from their website so you can learn a little bit more about how to incorporate that into your learning activities. Um, if you choose to do iNaturalist as a project, I strongly recommend checking out that teacher's guide it does need to be connected to a cell phone network or Wi-Fi in order to work. It is extremely public. 
you can obscure your location, but if you completely block your location, your identification um, is not considered research grade. Um, so that's up to you. Uh, if you want to keep your student information private, probably choose another app than this one um, or obscure lo your location and be okay with it not being research grade. Children under 13 cannot have their own account on this app. Um, so my suggestion if you wanted to use it would be to create an, uh, an account for your school and log in as your school and um, do it that way. Their website is www.inaturalist.org. Um, this is also a great app just to use personally. You can keep track of plants and animals that you've seen. I use it a lot for desert wildflower season. Um, and I try to increase my list every year. Um, again, this is, this is a good app. It keeps track of biodiversity as a whole. There are different projects that you can connect with. Um, We're doing one with Queen Macarancho State Park and cataloging flora and fauna in the park. Um, but again, there's a little bit of um, the public access. Pub the public does have access to this. There's no way around that one. And the last citizen science project I want to talk with you about today is Project Budburst, or now it's called just Budburst. Um, you might be familiar with it. Uh, they collect phenological data to track how plants are responding to climate change. It's a project of the Chicago Botanic Garden. It is web only. There is no app for this. Um, so because of that, you do need to be connected to a network to use. A great way to get kids into noticing how plants are changing seasonally and if there are patterns connected with those changes. It has a great educator's guide. It, um, is, it's an awesome uh, program to use in a classroom because you can visit the exact plants with the same students over um, over the course of a school year, and then they really get to be focused on those particular plants. And you can uh, create accounts under your own account for um, certain classes. So if you are a middle school or high school teacher and you're teaching this class or this activity in your um, classes, you can have groups for certain periods, um, you, if you're a volunteer coordinator, you can have your volunteers go out and use this and make individual accounts for your volunteers. Um, or if you wanted to have individual accounts for your individual students, that is also a possibility. It's really educator friendly. And their website is www.budburst.org or .org. They also have some great resources um, for identifying plants. Um, they have a wide variety of plants they're looking for, both natives and nativars, and also horticultural cultivars. So all kinds of plants are available for you to um, submit information for through Project Budburst, or I keep calling it that, it's Budburst now. They've dropped the project. <laughs> so what are some useful types of tech um, in outdoor education, tablets. They're portable. You can load some plant and animal ID apps. You can connect to citizen science projects. And if it has a camera, you can also use it as a camera. It's big enough to be used in a small group setting. So if you have a group of four, three or four students, or they can share it without you know, being uh, obstructed of their view. Smartphones are also something that you can use. They do the same things as tablets. They're a little bit smaller, but you should not expect your staff um, to use their personal device to collect data for your program um, unless you have that explicitly in the contract they have for them or you're paying for their cell phone. Um, a lot of people have cell phones anyway and don't mind using it, but don't expect your staff to be like, yes, I'm going to take my cell phone out into the woods for you. Um, cell phones are portable um, and I don't recommend that you have individual students use their personal cell phones unless 
um, your school, your program allows that. So be mindful of your school or your program's technology um, use policy for students and adhere to that. Monitors can be a form of technology that is used and I'm not talking about like baby monitors. <laughs> Please don't use those. Um, I'm talking about screens, like television screens that are not hooked up to television. Um, you can use those as signs. So giving out information that is written, um, use that instead of printed signs. The information can be easily changed on a computer. Um, so you can update your daily menus, you can put schedules up, you can type out a private or um, personalized welcome message to your program attendees. Um, you can change the calendar for the day or the week or the month and share it out that way um, as far instead of using, you know, paper products. Um, along those same lines, digital projectors and screens are great for large groups. You can share that information um, easily in a large group setting. If you have a big group program and you are sharing student expectations, or participant expectations, you can put that up on the screen. Um, we use our digital projectors and screens to show, um, oh, like a video yearbook of the week for our students, and they seem to like that. You can also do a game show. Um, there's an app called Kahoot where you can project a question and then students can answer on their tablet or smartphone. Um, so they can get involved that way. Um, so don't be afraid of technology. It's there. It can be useful if you take the time to check it out and evaluate it. If you have any questions or ideas about how to further the use of technology appropriately in outdoor ed, we would love to hear it. Again, my name is Katie Anderson. I'm an outdoor education specialist at Quimaca Outdoor School, and it's operated by the San Diego County Office of Education. If you need to get a hold of me, my email is kamiller at sdcoe.net, or you can just leave a message in the comments of this video. Um, I think I forgot to tell you at the beginning, I'm also a volunteer board member for AEOE, so I appreciate them giving me the chance to share this information with you in the Professional Development Digital Library. Um, and please, 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 just because we have a technology doesn't mean we should cut off our connection to nature. So please keep connecting to nature, get out there and keep connecting kids to nature so that we can have a fantastic world. Um, I would like to thank you for joining me today and have a wonderful rest of the day.